Our next lecture will be given by Dr. Peter Klein and his lectures on production and the firm. Peter? Thank you. Uh, I understand that Professor Salerno referred to me in his introduction, uh, and I certainly want to return the favor and say what an honor it is to follow him uh, and to be on the same program with someone so distinguished and someone of such advanced age. Um, <laughs> I think it's really cool that a lot of you guys have copies of various institute books and are getting autographs from the different speakers. You know, I wish I had thought of that when I was a student. Um, I was uh, attended Mises University many times when Murray Rothbard was one of the speakers, and I owned, I suppose I had most of his books that were in print at that time, but I never had the courage to ask him to sign any of them. I guess I thought I was too cool for that somehow, and I didn't want to act like you know it was a big deal. But of, of course, you know, then he passed away in 1995 without me ever getting him to autograph a book, and I, you know, that's one of my great regrets that I never did that. So of course, I have the books by Salerno and Block and DiLorenzo, and I'm definitely getting their autograph this week because <laughs> you don't know how much longer those guys are going to be around. <laughs> But anyway, <laughs> let's uh, continue our discussion of economic theory today uh, by discussing production and the firm. Uh, we've already talked about Austrian method and fundamental categories of action, uh, value and exchange, capital and interest, entrepreneurship, economic calculation, and so on. Um, I want to add another foundational topic to the mix here, namely to talk about production and the firm. Now, what do I mean by a firm? Right? I mean, what is a firm? What does the word firm mean? Well, if you ask a lay person, if you ask the man or woman on the street, you know, could you draw me a picture of a firm? You know, they might draw something like this, a factory, and there might be smoke coming out of the smokestacks and little workers going in or out. Uh, but of course, if you're an economics major, you know that a firm doesn't look like that at all. A firm looks like this. <laughs> or if you've been to graduate school, like this. <laughs> but so, so the, the point here is that um, the concepts of the firm you get in sort of mainstream economic theory don't correspond well at all to our common sense notion of what we mean by a business firm. Now. One of the confusions in the literature is that the term theory of the firm, as it's used in the mainstream textbooks, uh, sort of confuses two separate issues. One issue is, sorry, I thought I was missing a slide. Uh, one issue is uh, the theory of production, and the other issue is the theory of the firm per se. Now, what are some Austrian building blocks for thinking about the theory of production and the theory of the firm? Well, we already have the basic elements of such a theory uh, from our previous discussions this week, right? We have the notions of inputs and outputs. We have land, labor, and capital as inputs into production. And we have output, consumer goods, uh, as the end result of those production processes. We have Menger's notion of higher order goods, factors of production, versus lower order goods with goods that we consume being at the bottom of Menger's scale. Uh, we have the idea of prices, right? That in an economy in which resources are privately owned, uh, they can be exchanged in markets and they will generate market prices. That's information, as we discussed yesterday, that entrepreneurs use in making their, uh, in, in using their judgment, applying their understanding to try to estimate the costs and benefits and the net benefits of particular courses of action. Uh, we discussed that yesterday, and Professor Salerno discussed it a little bit today as well. Profit and loss, right? If the, if the money receipts from production exceed the outlays for the factors, taking into account uh, appropriate discounting for time preference, then the business venture has generated uh, a, a mon money profit. Uh, otherwise, it has generated a money loss. And as we discussed yesterday, the notion of production in the real world, in real time, implies the passage of time and the bearing of uncertainty. So the receipts are only realized in the future after production takes place, and they cannot be known with certainty 
when, the out, when decisions about production are made. The, 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 the agent who is driving this process, the economic actor who is purchasing factors of production, assembling them into different combinations, deploying them in an attempt to earn the largest possible money profit and to avoid money loss is the entrepreneur. And the entrepreneur's primary decision-making tool, as was discussed in the previous lecture, is economic calculation, comparing benefits and costs in a common unit, in a monetary unit. Now note that an Austrian approach to production in the firm has a particular flavor or has particular characteristics. Namely, we want a causal realist approach to production. Not the kind of production theory that one gets in the mainstream textbooks, which almost seems as if it's written by engineers. It emphasizes the physical technology of production rather than the economic valuation aspects, the notion of action, of means and ends, and so on. Right? Austrian economic theory, beginning with Menger, is a theory of causal relations. Uh, Menger begins his famous treatise by stating that the most fundamental economic principle is that of cause and effect. So we want a theory of production that is both causal and realist, that emphasizes real production processes, real prices, not hypothetical, perfectly competitive general equilibrium prices, uh, that is couched in terms of real factors of production, real resources, real production methods, and so on. So we often use the term causal realist to describe Misesian uh, economic theory, Austrian economic theory, and we certainly want a causal realist theory of production and the firm. Um, we want to explain uh, prices, quantities, characteristics of real goods and services exchanged in real markets. Right, not hypothetical goods and services in hypothetical markets. So, as I mentioned before, the term theory of the firm as it's used in the textbooks often confuses two separate issues. Right, what we might call the theory of production. What can we say about ways in which factors can be combined to producing consumer goods? What are the attributes of factors? What can we say about factor combinations, the characteristics of different combinations, and so on? Now, that includes elements such as the economy's structure of production, the relationships and interrelationships between higher order and lower order goods, how factors of production are priced. As we've already discussed yesterday and today, resources are exchanged in markets. Uh, entrepreneurs buy and sell factors. Uh, they're in, in factor markets where factor prices are determined. What can we say about those prices? How are they formed? And so on. And that helps us to understand the notion of cost from the perspective of the entrepreneur. Now, these are extremely important issues, but they're not, they're distinct from what we might call the theory of the firm per se, right? What is a firm? How large will the firm be? What is the nature of the firm? How are firms organized? Right, so by the theory of the firm, we have in mind something like the legal or common sense notion of an organization. Can we explain, uh, you know, Microsoft? What activities will be conducted by Microsoft? What activities will be conducted by other firms? What's done inside the firm? What's done between firms? So these are sort of uh, the, the sort of the classic questions in the theory of the, in the theory of the firm include why do entrepreneurs establish firms in the first place, as opposed to doing everything as a sort of diffused, loosely structured network of independent contractors? What determines the size and scope of the business firm? How should firms be organized and managed? But again, the firm, in this narrower sense, refers to legal boundaries. Who owns, which entrepreneurs will own which resources? And how will those entrepreneurs combine these resources in productive ways? The theory of production asks what inputs, how are particular inputs used to produce particular outputs? Unfortunately, the term theory of the firm, until pretty recently, was used by mainstream economists to describe both of these areas. And of course, most of the attention, 90% of the attention, was on the first set of questions, with very little attention 
until the last 20 years or so, being devoted to the latter set. We'll talk about both of those today. Um, now, those of you who have taken a course in intermediate micro theory in a mainstream economics department have probably seen plenty of pictures like this. Okay, so the neoclassical approach to production usually proceeds along something like the following lines. Uh, you ima imagine a production process, and this, I copied and pasted this from some, te uh, some textbook that I had. I think it's producing, uh, producing automobiles or something like that, and there are two inputs, aluminum and steel. The factor prices, the prices of aluminum and steel are given exogenously in some hypothetical factor market, and these pink lines on the left-hand side represent uh, different combinations of input A and input B that all have the same cost, so-called ISO cost lines. The black curvy line is what they call an ISO quant, showing you how different combinations of input A and input B uh, can be used to produce a certain quantity of output. How many of you have seen these kind of pictures before? You can do all the usual fun stuff, right? You can, you can shift you can change input prices and shift curves around and say what's the least costly way to produce one unit of output, two units of output, 10 units of output, or whatever. You notice it looks a lot like an indifference curve diagram. If you've seen those before, right? So there's a, a nice kind of formal symmetry between neoclassical production theory and neoclassical consumption theory that people like if they value mathematical tractability above, above other things. Um, the way these diagrams are used is, okay, we'll figure out what's the least costly way to produce certain quantities of output, and then we plot those when it, we get something like the middle diagram, which is a, a total cost curve, right? So we put on the horizontal axis the quantity of automobiles, whatever it is. So if I want to produce one automobile, what's the cheapest way to do it? How much does it cost? If I want to produce 10 automobiles, what's the cheapest way to do it? How much does that cost? And so on. You get this nice total cost curve from which one can derive all of the other cost curves that mainstream textbooks like to diagram and, 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 and fiddle around with and so on. You've got a marginal cost curve, an average cost curve, average total cost, average variable cost, average fixed cost. You can, you can sort of do these out the, out, out the wazoo, as they say. And then there's all sorts of things you can do to play with these curves. Um, one of the things that's interesting, if you look at um, human action and man economy and state, uh, both of them devote considerable attention to production theory. Man economy and state in particular uh, devotes about five chapters, five very lengthy chapters to the theory of production. And there are even some diagrams, some charts, some equations. But one thing that's completely absent from human action and man economy and state, is any cost curves. There's no cost curve diagrams like these whatsoever. And that would strike you as odd because those are the kinds of pictures that dominate the conventional microeconomics textbooks on the theory of production. You know, how does the, how does the firm maximize profits given these cost curves and some revenue curves? And, you know, the curves have different shapes depending on the circumstances, and that's basically what the what production theory is all about is manipulating cost and revenue curves. But there are no cost curves in the Austrian treatments of production. Why is that? Well, there are a number of problems, excuse me, problems with this kind of approach to production. For example, the notion that factor and output prices are taken as given, but then used ultimately to explain factor and output prices. What I mean is, in this sort of standard approach, we take uh, all of the price, the, the, the decision maker is assumed to be a price taker from which these curves and so on can be derived, but then the curves are used to explain the price in the market and the prices of aluminum and steel or whatever. So there's a sort of circular reasoning in taking factor prices and output prices as given, using them to derive uh, sort of an analytical apparatus that is then supposed to explain factor prices and output prices. Um, you, you know, you can make these things fancy. You can, you can have a demand curve that's downward sloping instead of horizontal. You can derive factor demand curves. and You can have all kinds of strategic interaction among the decision makers and so on. 
However, in all of these cases, some things are absent. There is no time or uncertainty in this approach to production. There's no time whatsoever because uh, production and consumption are simultaneous. There are no stages of production that take place through real, uh, that you know, are arranged in real time. The decision to purchase a certain quantity of inputs and produce a certain amount of output, those are the simultaneous set of simultaneous decisions. Uh, there is no causal explanation for factor prices. As I've mentioned before, factor prices are assumed to be given, and then the model is used to derive a set of factor prices. Um, you know, th there's a sense in which this kind of approach, if you, if you, if you want to use this language, emphasizes kind of uh, a set of equilibrium conditions, right? If the curves look like this, and the input prices have these values, and the output prices have these values, and there are these many firms with these characteristics, then the market is in equilibrium. So it's kind of a general equilibrium, in a sense, or a, me a mechanistic, simultaneous determination kind of approach to production. It's very different from Menger's notion of a causal realist explanation. And you know, another way we could uh, characterize the problem, as Murray Rothbard did, is that this approach to the firm emphasizes the wrong problems. It emphasizes the wrong problems. What I mean is, the important issues of production here are portrayed as if, uh, you know, they're shown from the perspective of the plant manager. So imagine there's a, you know, this is a factory, right? It's a factory producing whatever, automobiles, and there's inputs, aluminum and steel, and the decision that the decision maker is faced with is what quantity of output to produce and what quantities of input to, inputs to purchase. Okay, and you can, if you have the equations, you can solve it and you know, find out the optimal profit maximizing quantity. I remember when I studied this stuff in school, in graduate school, my friends and I used to joke you know, about hiring ourselves out to major manufacturing firms as consultants. And we would go into you know, Toyota or something and say, okay, look, here's, the problem is you guys want to maximize profits. Okay? <laughs> if you just show me your cost curves, Right? I can find the tangency point for you, or if I'm fancy, you know, I, can, I can take the first derivative and set it equal to zero, and I'll tell you the profit maximizing quantity, and you'll pay me a million bucks or whatever. Okay? <laughs> you know, that's not really the interesting problem that Toyota faces. Okay? In other words, if, there is a, if there's a plant in a particular spot, uh, those of you who came in from Atlanta by car, most of you, you, you remember passing that huge Kia plant that's in West Georgia? I mean, it's an enormous... Uh, factory. You know, assume that that Kia plant is already set up and all the, you know, everything's already in place. The inputs are readily available. The outputs are already, you know, ready. All you have to do is figure out what's Q star and press a button and psh, optimal quantity. I mean, okay, you know, once you get to that point, it's pretty easy, right? The hard questions are things like, well, why is there a Kia plant there in the first place? <laughs> right? Why does Kia Motors exist? Um, why did the, the, the top level decision makers decide to put a factory there in West Georgia and not someplace else? Why is it of a certain size? Why does the plant manager, the one who's making this decision of should we produce one more car today or one fewer car today, how did that manager come to be there? How, who, who gave the decision making authority to that particular manager? Right? You know, the whole idea of taking cost and revenue curves and finding the place where MR is equal to MC. That's almost a trivial problem compared to the real problem of how do you produce cars and where do you set up the production processes and how much capital do you give to each plant and so on. Solving for MR equals MC is, I mean, anybody can do that. An economics freshman, a freshman economics major can do that. Okay, that, that, that's the wrong problem. Um, there's a very interesting discussion in Mises' Human Action on socialism and the socialist calculation debate, uh, where he, uh, uh, Professor Salerno outlined Mises' argument, his, Mises' famous argument about the impossibility of economic calculation under socialism. Now, after Mises presented his argument, there were a number of responses and critiques by pro-socialist economists 
And some of them in the 1930s and 1940s said, well, okay, you, you know, Mises is right that you couldn't, you couldn't have a sort of complete top-down centrally planned system, but why couldn't you set up uh, a socialist economy in which you have factories, production plants, just like in a capitalist economy, and you have managers who decide how much to produce, and you know, instead of them being you know, employees of a capitalist firm, we'll just make them all civil servants. Right? The government will own all the factories, and we'll hire plant managers who will work for the government, and we'll put them in these factories, and we'll say, hey, do the same thing that you would do if this were capitalism. In other words, take the cost curves and solve for everything and find the quantity where MR is equal to MC. Won't it be just like capitalism? How will it be any different? And it, it, you know, Mises' uh, characteristically insightful reply is that these market socialist proponents completely misconceive what capitalism is all about. The central problem of resource allocation under capitalism is not what quantity, you know, maximizes profit given all the characteristics of the firm. The real problems are how does an economy allocate factors of production to different activities? How much capital should the auto industry have compared to some other industry? How much capital should Kia have compared to some other automobile manufacturer? How much capital should be invested in this factory that's here rather than somewhere else? as opposed to other Kia plants and factories. How do you decide who will be the, the plant manager and you know, who, who will perform other tasks? Those are the really critical problems solved in a private property regime that no socialist system can possibly address. If the resources, if factors of production are owned by the state and individuals involved in these decisions are employees of the state, then there's no way to answer those questions of what should be done and how it should be done. So you see that implicitly what Mises is doing is criticizing the neoclassical theory of production and saying all of this intellectual energy is wasted on answering a second order trivial question. What's the profit maximizing quantity given this, 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 this? What's really important is those, those givens. Where did they come from? What determines them? And so on. So what, what does an alternative account of production look like? Well, we want to build on Austrian constructs. Uh, we start with Menger on, and Bombavirk and Mises and Hayek and so on. As I mentioned before, there's this middle section of Man, Economy, and State, chapters 5 through 9, which provides one of the most detailed and certainly the most systematic exposition of Austrian production theory. Also, uh, Ludwig Lachmann's 1952 book, Capital and Its Structure, which has, as of late has been somewhat neglected within the Austrian tradition, uh, is a valuable contribution to this literature as well. Uh, Israel Kirzner's essay on capital should be mentioned in this context also. The key issues that we want to address are what determines the prices of factors of production and how factors of production will be used. We want to try to understand and explain the economy's structure of production. And we want to incorporate the notions of entrepreneurial profit and loss. So let's start with some considerations about factor pricing. So we have factors of production, land, labor, and capital. And notice, by the way, labor, of course, doesn't just mean physical labor, manual labor. Uh, So-called white-collar jobs, management jobs, are part of the labor force as well. Um, what can we say about land, labor, and capital? How they're priced, uh, how they're priced on a rental basis, how they're priced on a purchase basis, and so on. Well, one of the fundamental concepts here is the, the notion developed by Austrian economists in the 19th and early 20th centuries, which has come to be known as the theory of imputation. The theory of imputation. And this is the idea that the prices of factors of production as determined in factor markets, where entrepreneurs are bidding against each other for the services of factors, depend on, in simple terms, the, the, the value of marginal units of factors to the entrepreneur. The prices of factors are determined by the value of those factors to the entrepreneur. Uh, technical terminology that uh, 
factors that you rent, like labor, right? So you rent the labor services of an individual and you pay him or her so many dollars per hour or dollars per week or whatever. How much is an entrepreneur willing to pay for somebody's labor? Well, they want to calculate how much more output do I get by employing that additional labor? And how much do I think I can sell that output for on the market? Like uh, the Derek Jeter example that uh, Professor Herbener used yesterday. And uh, uh, Rothbard calls this the, the discounted marginal value product. You might say, in modern terminology, discounted marginal revenue product. Right? So the marginal revenue product is the addition to anticipated total revenues from employing one more unit of the input or factor. And of course, the entrepreneur has to discount this by the rate of interest because the payments from selling the output are uh, received in the future, whereas the outlay for the wage paid to the factor is, is paid earlier in time. Um, so uh, in, 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 in a sort of equilibrium state, the prices of these rental factors would be equal to their discounted marginal revenue products. Now, there's some important uh, uh, sort of conditions. Factors must be uh, non-specific for this condition to hold. In other words, if a factor is purely specific to one production process or purely specific to one entrepreneur, then you don't have the condition of multiple entrepreneurs bidding against each other for the services of that factor. And if the factor owner has a very strong bargaining position, is very skilled at bargaining, the factor owner may be able to command a higher price than the discounted marginal revenue product. Uh, the factor must also be what Rothbard calls isolable, meaning that uh, you can isolate the contribution of that factor from the contribution of the other complementary factors that are used in production. So if you have a factor that can only be used in a fixed proportion with other factors, so you know the steering wheel on an automobile, right? you can't add a second steering wheel and sell the car for a little bit more, and add a third steering wheel and sell the car for a little bit more. right? So you don't, you don't generate more revenues by adding more steering wheels, because you need one steering wheel and four tires, and one speedometer, and so on, that have to be used in particular proportions to produce an automobile. So just having one more steering wheel doesn't generate more revenue unless you also have four more tires, and one more speedometer, and so on and so forth. Of course, that doesn't apply to all inputs into car production. You know, a little bit more steel, you can make a little bit bigger car, and maybe sell it for more. But there may be some factors whose contribution to production cannot be isolated from the contribution of other factors. Because the whole bundle is, uh, you can value the whole bundle of factors, but not the individual factors. Uh, these are qualifications, right? In those cases, in these uh, sort of strange cases, you have bargaining between entrepreneurs and factor owners. But given that the factor is nonspecific, at least partially, and isolable, at least partially, then its price on the factor market will tend to be determined by its discounted marginal revenue product. So I'm just restating in different words what Professor Herbener was saying yesterday about Derek Jeter, right? So the reason why professional athletes get paid a lot and economics professors get paid very little is because the market value of their output is, strangely, a much higher than the market value of ours, okay? Um, you know, factors of production that can be bought and sold in their entirety uh, the, the purchase prices are determined by sort of capitalizing the future stream of rental prices, as in a machine. Uh, you can rent a machine and you'll pay the discounted marginal revenue product of the services of that machine. If you can buy the machine outright, that price will tend to be set by sort of the present value of this future stream of rental prices that would accrue to renting the factor. Okay. Um, you know, th this is pretty straightforward stuff. I mean, no, there's nothing, nothing fancy going on here. But this was, a, this was a major innovation in economic theory because for a long time, economists had believed that the causal relationship between the values of factors and the values of outputs ran the other way. Right? The classical view, for example, was that the costs of production are what determine 
the prices of the output. Right? What determines how much uh, you know, a, 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 a smartphone will sell for in the market? Well, it depends on the costs of producing that phone. If these costs are very high, the entrepreneur will have to add a markup and therefore will have to charge a very high price in the market. What the Austrians showed is that the causation is the other way around. Not from the costs of the factors to the price of the product, but rather from the price of the product to the cost of the factors. In other words, remember, according to Menger, value is subjective. Consumers have subjective valuations for the goods and services they consume. Those values are reflected in the purchase prices of consumer goods. And those prices are, in a sense, imputed backward, imputed up the production chain, up the supply chain, until you get to the inputs that are used to produce those outputs. Right? Uh, Mises used the example of uh, land prices. Right? So this is, uh, this is a picture of a vineyard in the Champagne region of France. Right? So if you go down to uh, the grocery store, the liquor store, or whatever, and buy a bottle of champagne here in Auburn, maybe to celebrate the end of Mises U, if it's good champagne, you, know, you might pay 100 bucks for the bottle, or even much more if it's high-end champagne. Right? Why is champagne so expensive? Well, the classical explanation, to a large degree adopted by Marx as well, is that, well, the reason a bottle of champagne costs so much is because the land that is used to produce the grapes that make champagne is really expensive land. And it's true, if you try to buy up this uh, uh, farmland in this region of France, I mean, the land prices are sky high, right? So it's, it takes a lot of money to produce champagne because you've got to buy this expensive land. Therefore, you charge a high price uh, for the bottle. But of course, a few moments reflection make us realize that that can't be the explanation, right? What if consumers decide they don't like champagne anymore? Okay, if people's preferences, taste change, or you know, other alternative beverages come onto the market, and you know, consumers decide they'd rather drink a Red Bull than a bottle of champagne, or whatever it is. Okay, uh, and the demand for for drinking champagne falls. What's going to happen to the market price of these bottles of champagne on the grocery shelves? Those prices are going to fall, right? Sellers will try to unload their inventories, they'll discount the price of champagne, and eventually the market price of champagne drinks is going to go down. Well, what's going to happen to the price of the land that is used to grow the grapes to make champagne? Well, I mean, if this land is, you know, if the highest valued use of this land is to produce something that nobody wants to buy, then who wants to own this land? There's no value in owning the land. So it is the value that consumers place on the drink, champagne, that determines the prices of the land that is used to grow the grapes that are used to make the champagne. Okay, so prices determine costs, not the other way around. Okay? Uh, all costs are ultimately opportunity costs. All costs are ultimately opportunity costs. Right? That's what we as Austrians mean by cost. You know, I mentioned yesterday the cost to you of sitting here in this lecture, listening to this lecture, is the value of the other things that you're not doing because you're here instead of doing those other things. That's the cost to you, the value foregone. But it's the same thing in, a, in the production process, right? The, the cost of using this land to produce grapes to make into champagne is the value of the consumer goods and services that we don't have because this land wasn't used to make them instead. Okay, so costs are not, in a sense, exogenous to the, to the market valuation process. Costs are the result of consumer valuations. It's always consumer valuations that determine business behavior, not the other way around. Okay. And this is you know, why we have confidence in stating that in a market economy, in which, goods, in which factors of production can be bought and sold in markets, they will tend to be allocated to their highest valued use. In other words, resources will tend to flow towards those entrepreneurs and those production processes in which they are used to make the goods and services that consumers desire the most relative to other goods and services that could be produced with those same inputs 
and by those same entrepreneurs. Okay? Mises' whole notion of consumer sovereignty, that the consumer is the captain of the ship, not the factory owner, not the industrialist, not the manager, it derives precisely from this Austrian notion of imputation. Okay. Now, consider the role, consider in more detail the role of the entrepreneur in making all this happen. Right? Remember, we're, we're not assuming that champagne sort of comes into existence on its own. Uh, the consumers sort of push a button and instantly champagne comes into existence. No, there are thinking, choosing, acting human beings involved in every step of the process. Entrepreneurs who conceive of the drink and ways it might be produced and use economic calculation to determine what's the least costly way to produce this product and hope that consumers will desire it and so on, right? So in uh, what uh, Mises and Rothbard call the evenly rotating economy, kind of an equilibrium, kind of a long run equilibrium state, uh, factors of production, will tend to earn their discounted marginal revenue products. Labor will be paid what it's worth on the margin. Land will be paid what it's worth on the margin, meaning its value to consumers, uh, the value of the goods and services it produces, to value to consumers of what it produces, discounted for the rate of interest. Capitalists will earn interest payments as compensation for foregoing current consumption and making their capital resources available to, to, to be used in production. But there won't be any profits and losses. Why? Well, because if I'm an entrepreneur producing champagne, right, and I earn a certain amount of revenues from the production of that champagne, well, all of these revenues are paid out to the inputs that are used in the production process. Okay? by the marginal productivity theory of, uh, of valuation and distribution. In other words, there's nothing left over after all the factors of production have been paid. Why? Well, because if, you know, if I could produce champagne that's worth, and sell it, a bottle of champagne and sell it for 100 bucks, and I can buy land and labor and so on to produce that bottle of champagne for only 80 bucks, having something left over, well, that provides an incentive for other entrepreneurs to outbid me for those factors of production. Another entrepreneur says, well, you know, I'll pay 81 for that factor bundle. And somebody else says, I'll pay 82, right? And the factors of production would be bid up to the discounted value of that $100 worth of output. There wouldn't be anything left over for the entrepreneur. In the real world, of course, the values of factors of production, these discounted marginal revenue products, are not known with certainty, right? They're not given by textbook authors. Rather, they have to be anticipated. They have to be uh, um, guessed or forecast by entrepreneurs using understanding, using judgment. And some entrepreneurs will be better at this than others, right? Some entrepreneurs will make mistakes. They'll say, hey, I can buy these factors for 80 bucks and combine them into a bottle that I can sell for 100, and they go out and spend the 80 bucks and they build their thing and the, their bottle and they put it on the shelf, you know, six months later and nobody wants it. You know, people, people aren't willing to pay 70 for it. Okay, and leaving discounting aside, the, this entrepreneur has lost 10 bucks. And maybe 10 bucks per bottle and it's a big operation, it's a big deal and he's out of business. Okay, another entrepreneur uh, was more accurate in his or her forecasts of what consumers would be willing to pay and is able to purchase factors of production for less than their eventual discounted marginal revenue product, thus having something left over. The point is that profit and loss are exclusively the result of uncertainty. Building on the discussion we had yesterday about uncertainty and entrepreneurship, in a world without uncertainty, where output prices are known in advance, and discounted marginal revenue products can be known in advance, there's nothing left over for the entrepreneur, either positive or negative. It's only in a world of uncertainty where discounted marginal revenue products must be estimated, anticipated by entrepreneurs that we have profits and losses. Okay, so again, we're not talking about probabilistic risk here that can be estimated 
you know, uh, you know, approximated with a probability distribution function and so on, but rather true uncertainty, what Knight called uncertainty rather than risk. Let's spend a few minutes now talking about the theory of the firm per se. How do we get from these notions of the production process, how production takes place, how factors are priced, what determines costs, and so on, to saying something about the firm as sort of a formal entity, the firm as a legal entity, who owns what and why. Um, as I mentioned before, in the mainstream uh, micro theory textbooks, you get very little uh, about this issue at all. Right? What they mean by a firm is typically a production process, a production function, y is equal to f of x1, x2, x3, and so on. So the theory of the firm in micro textbooks is the theory of a productive process. And as I've suggested in the last few minutes, it's not a very good theory of a production process. Okay? Uh, now there has been some, uh, you know, there have been many important theoretical developments in the last two or three decades trying to flesh out this notion of the firm as a legal entity. Uh, what's sometimes called transaction cost theory or the transaction cost approach associated with people like Oliver Williamson, one of uh, the Nobel laureates from the year before this last year. Um, there's also what's become known as the property rights approach to the firm associated with people like Oliver Hart at Harvard, uh, defining the firm not as a production function, but in terms of ownership of resources. And I think this is essentially the right way to define a firm, that really what we're interested in is who owns what assets and why, right? So in this way of thinking about the firm, the definition of a firm is an entrepreneur, a capitalist entrepreneur, plus the assets the alienable assets, meaning assets that can be bought and sold, that the entrepreneur owns. It could be a single capitalist entrepreneur. It could be a team of capitalist entrepreneurs who jointly own factors of production, such as a partnership or a set of shareholders in a corporation. Uh, ownership of factors of production in this conception conveys a kind of authority, kind of decision-making authority about how factors of production will be used. What do I mean? Well, in, in, in a world of, if there's no uncertainty, if there's, if there's uh, merely probabilistic risk or even no risk at all, then uh, people can write contracts with each other that stipulate exactly who gets to do what under particular circumstances. Right, so I hire Mark Thornton as my employee to run my Kia plant and I can write a contract that says exactly what he has to do under particular circumstances, how, how fast he should run the machines, how many cars he should ship out, and so on, under you know, different conditions that we specify. However, in the real world of uncertainty, there will always arise situations that we didn't previously agree upon. So there's some condition in the market, something that affects supply, technological innovation, perhaps change in market conditions that wasn't previously covered in my agreement with Mark. Who has the ultimate decision? Who has the final say on how the assets that are owned by Kia will be used? Well, the definition of ownership in this context is the right to make decisions about the use of resources in circumstances that weren't previously agreed upon. Okay, so the whole idea of me being the owner and Mark being my employee, my hired manager, is that you know, if something comes up that we didn't previously agree upon, the person who gets to make the final call is me, because I own the factory. He doesn't, he's just my employee, he's, he's a contract worker. He agreed to do certain things in exchange for a certain payment, but when conditions arise that were not specified in our agreement, he has no authority. Right? Ownership conveys the right to make decisions about how factors will be used in conditions not previously specified by contract. That's what ownership is in this context. So notice, some of you may have heard, uh, may be familiar with the terminology used by Hayek. Uh, Hayek wrote a famous article called Taxis and Cosmos, talking about two different kind of, sort of forms of social organization. Right? A taxis is what 
Hayek described as sort of a, a designed order, something that's designed from the top down, like central planning, for example. Whereas a cosmos is sort of spontaneous order or something that emerges from the bottom up, an emergent order, to use popular uh, a term that you hear sometimes today. In this context, the firm is not a cosmos, but a, rather a taxis. There's the firm is designed by its owners, right? The owner or owners get together and make conscious decisions about what to produce and how to produce it and what resources to acquire and what assets to divest and so on. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that every single detail of the firm's operations are planned from the top down. That would be impossible in any kind of large, complex organization, in all but the simplest organizations. It simply means that the owners always, by the virtue of their ownership, have a kind of residual controlling authority. So even if I delegate a lot of day-to-day -day responsibility to Mark and then go off to my you know, yacht in the Caribbean or whatever, um, the fact that I chose to hire Mark, that I can fire him if I want, that I chose to delegate certain authority to him, and that I can take that authority back if I desire, means that I'm the ultimate decision maker. The owner is the ultimate decision maker in this sense. Now, you notice that there isn't a one-to-one -one relationship between the firm as ownership of assets and the production process or the production function in modern jargon. Right, one firm can own multiple production processes, uh, you know, a multi-divisional, multi-plant, multi-product firm that has, you know, produces different outputs and has many different plants and so on. Uh, some firms don't own any production processes whatsoever. I was talking to a guy at the conference yesterday uh, who uh, 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 has sort of a virtual business. He sits in front of a computer screen and uh, he, uh, he sells things to consumers on his website. He doesn't own any manufacturing or distribution. Uh, he outsources all of the production to, I don't know, somebody in China maybe. And he uh, uses UPS or FedEx to do his distribution and delivery. Uh, PayPal to you know, do the payment processing and so on. That's still a firm because this individual owns, he owns his own labor. Uh, he owns his computer. He owns the facility that he uses and so on but he doesn't own a production process, he contracts that out. Um, firms can jointly operate production processes through a joint venture, for example. So the theory of, the, of production is not the same thing as the theory of the firm. These two theories address different questions. Uh, you know, what, what does Austrian economics say about these classic questions in the theory of the firm? Why do firms exist? What determines how big they are, their boundaries? What determines how they are organized? Um, in my own work on these questions, I've built extensively on the insights of Ronald Coase, a Chicago economist, idiosyncratic economist, who wrote a famous paper published in the 1930s called The Nature of the Firm, which has really become the basis of almost all of the modern research on firms as organizations. Uh, Coase's emphasis was on what he called transaction costs, the costs of transacting in the market. The argument offered by Coase is that there are some advantages to authority or hierarchy in the sense that I've described it, the authority or hierarchy that comes along with ownership. In principle, you know, Mark and I could be independent contractors. Uh, I own some stuff, he owns some stuff, and we get together to work out some arrangement by which we produce cars, but that may not be an efficient way to organize automobile production. Every time new circumstances arise, we have to renegotiate our contract. Uh, every time I want to do something, I have to deal with Mark or find somebody else to deal with. I have to negotiate with input providers. I have to negotiate with marketing firms and so on to sell my stuff. Maybe I don't want to do that. I don't want to have to renegotiate with these different trading partners every time a decision needs to be made. I prefer to own all of the resources that are needed for doing this activity and have people like Mark and the other uh, uh, actors involved as my hired employees with authority over them. Again, it's a purely voluntary set of market transactions in which, you know, if I can offer Mark a high enough wage, he would willingly be my employee subject to my authority 
rather than be a free agent and independent contractor. If in fact it is more efficient to reduce these costs of negotiating and exchanging information and so on, then I can afford to pay him more than he would earn as, a, as his own man. Okay? So Coase emphasized that firms exist to economize on these transaction costs of negotiations and exchange among different owners of factors. Um, if we add to this the Knightian notion of entrepreneurial judgment, we realize that, look, there are certain things that you can exchange in markets, certain things that you can buy and sell or write a contract over, but the exercise of judgment, the exercise of ultimate authority over the use of productive factors is not something that itself can be contracted for. In other words, you don't buy and sell judgment in the market. You buy and sell assets. Okay, so if I own the Kia plant, I have ultimate responsibility over how that Kia plant, how the building and machines will be used under conditions of uncertainty. I delegate some authority to Mark, but I cannot delegate to Mark the ultimate authority for how these resources will be used unless I sell him the factory and make him the owner. Because that's the definition of ownership, the one who holds these ultimate decision rights. So if I wish to exercise judgment, what Knight calls judgment in production, the only way I can do that is to buy some assets, is to own some productive resources, is to be a capitalist entrepreneur. So I may have great ideas about producing cars, I may have this great vision. I may imagine an opportunity to make money producing cars, but I do not become an entrepreneur until I actually purchase factors of production, combine them in particular ways, and deploy them to produce stuff. Okay, so I have to invest resources to exercise the entrepreneurial function. In other words, that's why entrepreneurs start firms because the entrepreneur must own some assets to exercise entrepreneurial judgment. And once you have an entrepreneur plus some assets, you have a firm, okay? What determines the boundaries of the firm? How big should Kia be? How many plants should Kia own? How many different cars should Kia make? Should Kia be vertically integrated? In other words, manufacture its own steering wheels and its own engines and it put together its own chassis and so on? Or should it, uh, should it contract a lot of that out? Should it be more like Toyota, if they uses what they call a lean production system with few inventories and a lot of outsourcing of production to partners? Well, these are questions that economic theory can't answer for a specific case. That's a matter of, that is itself a matter of entrepreneurial judgment. What we can say is that um, these boundary decisions will be influenced by what Coase called transaction costs. If it is very costly to outsource my components because it takes a lot of negotiation and renegotiation with a company that builds the engines, I'll, I'll, it'll be more cost effective for me to build the engines myself. Okay, if it's costly to use an independent you know, marketing firm, I'll tend to do my own marketing. At the same time, the cost of uh, managing in-house production and in-house marketing must be taken into consideration as well. If it's very difficult to motivate employees, to monitor employees and so on, well then I may find that it's more cost effective to source that, to, to outsource. So the decision to insource or outsource is affected by what the entrepreneur expects the costs of external versus internal production to be. Of course there's a market for entrepreneurial talent and there are limits to entrepreneurial judgment, right? A skilled entrepreneur cannot oversee you know, an infinite amount of productive activity. There's some limits to how many products, how many plants, how many assets the entrepreneur can own and control in a way that is consistent with satisfying consumer wants. And the market will tend to penalize entrepreneurs who grow too fast, who acquire too many assets, and are not able to deploy them in ways that satisfy consumers. Because other entrepreneurs will enter and compete against uh, those, those incumbents. Okay? Um, Rothbard has a, a very interesting discussion in Man, Economy, and State 
which I uh, elaborated on in a 1996 article on how the socialist calculation problem, the need to be able to calculate profits and losses in terms of money prices, limits the size of the firm. Because as the firm grows larger, external markets for its inputs and, it out, and its out, and intermediate products and so on begin to disappear as they're internalized. And the entrepreneur loses valuable information that is embodied in those market prices. So this places a limit on how efficient a large firm can be, and therefore how large a firm can become on the free market. Okay. Um, Again, you can read about this in Rothbard and in my 1996 article. Um, so, what do, we, what do we get out of all of this? <laughs> Mark's giving me the evil eye, so I'll tell you what we get. Um, <laughs> but my, my, you know, my claim is that Austrian economics offers, you know, sort of a, a, a unique account of the production process. It's not just a verbal rendition of neoclassical micro. And that's what you sometimes hear critics say. They say, well, you know, Austrians talk about inputs and outputs and production and marginal revenue products and so on. Same thing as neoclassical, it's just the Austrians don't use math. I'm trying to, uh, the argument I'm offering is that that isn't the case whatsoever. That what the Austrians are arguing is a causal realistic analysis of factor pricing and factor use. It's grounded in subjectivism and marginal utility theory. It's, uh, it's, it's built on the fundamentals of human action and not a mechanistic, deterministic, sort of physics-based approach, engineering-based approach to production. It emphasizes the economic, not the technological aspects of production. Uh, of course, there's a lot more that needs to be done in this area. The theory of rent uh, is somewhat underdeveloped in the Austrian tradition, the theory of factor, uh, factor rents. Uh, I've done some research on the internal organization of the firm from an Austrian perspective, but I think there's room to do a lot more work in this area. Um, relating the microeconomic, microeconomics of production, of we, as we've discussed it today, to the macroeconomic aspects of the business cycle is something that is extremely important. Um, as you've already learned, and we'll be learning more this week, right? the Austrian business cycle theory is not only a, it's not just a theory of entrepreneurial error, but it's a theory of the misallocation of productive resources, right? A structure of production that is distorted, if you like, or is not organized in a way that's consistent with the pattern of final goods and services desired by consumers. What, what causes economic disruptions, right, is that we cannot instantly and costlessly readjust the structure of production when interest rates change, when changes of, in consumer preferences are revealed and so on, right? Because factors of production are at least partially specific to particular activities, to particular lines of business. That's the whole idea, right? You have a Austrian business cycle theory, you have a half-finished building and then, you know, interest rates rise, the real estate market crashes. You can't instantly convert those bricks into something else. I mean, you got a half-finished house, and it takes a while to convert those resources, the relatively specific resources, capital in particular, to alternative uses. It's not that bricks don't have uses, don't have value used elsewhere. It's that it takes a while to convert them, right? Well, this gets at the notions of factor specificity, the isolability of different factors, the degrees to which factors can be used in multiple production processes. This is a, sort of a linchpin of the Austrian theory of the business cycle, but the more explicit connections to the micro aspects, microeconomic aspects of production, have not, in my view, fully been brought out in the Austrian literature. This would be a good research project for, for a, a young Austrian scholar. Um, there's more that can be done as well uh, in critiquing the cost curve analysis. I hinted at some of the reasons why Austrians don't use cost curves. Because cost curves take costs, take factor prices as given, and go on to do other things. Whereas Austrians seek to explain factor prices. But there's clearly much more research that can be done in doing this kind of critique as well. So I guess it's lunchtime, and I better stop. <laughs>